So good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to announce a talk by Florica Kirsta from the from Sydney University about anisotropic elliptic equations. Uh, Florica is an expert on uh, elliptic equations, especially on blow up of solutions. And I understand that this is somewhat a new direction of research. Am I right? I've been uh, working also with Jerome before I had the paper on anisotropic elliptic uh, yeah. So it's not the first work. Yeah. So, so please, uh, if you have questions, then uh, please raise your hand or ask in chat, and then I will let you to, uh, to speak. Thank you. Please start, Florica. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for the introduction. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to give a research talk uh, in the Asia Pacific Analysis and PD seminar series. It is a great pleasure. And um, the topic is uh, on anisotropic elliptic equations. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I've started something like 2014 uh, to work on anisotropic elliptic equations. I've uh, been introduced to the topic by Jérôme Vetois. And uh, this uh, uh, recently, uh, in the last uh, two, three years, I've been looking at a number of problems uh, on isotropic elliptic equations. Uh, and this uh, talk today is based on research on uh, joint work with Barbara Brandolini from the University uh, of Palermo. And uh, research is supported by the Australian Research Council. In fact, uh, Barbara came to visit me for two months in August, September, 2019, so before COVID. Uh, so two months we, we were um, looking at such uh, problems and uh, we have continued since, since then. So this is uh, in fact uh, um, the foundation uh, of um, some uh, uh, research uh, that we are still continuing. Uh, so what I would like today to uh, tell you a number of general results, uh, existence results for uh, anisotropic elliptic equations and our focus here was to try to get a, like as general as possible uh, a framework in which we can obtain solutions in the anisotropic uh, sobolus spaces uh, that are the counterpart of the W01P. Uh, but let me say a little bit about the inspiration behind uh, our um, our work. So in a series of papers, uh, Lucio Bocardo with various collaborators uh, studied the nonlinear elliptic problems in a bounded open subset uh, omega var n. And these uh, problems involved coercive, bounded, continuous, and pseudomonotone uh, Lorelius type operators from the, the space W0MP into its dual, with p greater than one, less than infinity, and p prime is the dual conjugate of p. And their prototype model was the p Laplacian uh, operator. And I've uh, put here a number of papers uh, that uh, um, inspired us, uh, Ben Susan Bocardo, 2002, and other papers uh, uh, in the uh, early uh, 1990s. Uh, the, the techniques that they developed uh, allowed them to uh, consider lower order terms with uh, so-called natural growth in the gradient. So the gradient appearing to the power P as the P from the P Laplacian, and they had no restriction in, uh, in, with respect to the growth in modulus and u. And uh, what uh, their solutions were uh, obtained in the space W0MP, the, so the problems had a digitally homogeneous digitally boundary condition. And uh, what allowed them to, and, and uh, what allowed them to tackle, uh, in fact, uh, uh, also uh, functions in L1, so low data mobility. Uh, the submobility F is in L1 or uh, H in the dual of W0MP uh, was the, the fact that G had this, uh, a good sign condition, uh, which was translated in the fact that the G of X as psi times S is non-negative. So uh, let me give an illustration of a result, for example. So if you look at uh, uh, this theorem one, uh, taken from the paper Ben Susan Bocatan, 1988, uh, for every uh, m greater than one, lambda positive p greater than one and h in uh, w minus one p prime, you can find a solution to the problem one, denoted by one. So the solutions are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in w0 on p, uh, and also uh, u is in lm 
um, and lambda is a positive parameter and the term uh, lambda modulus u m minus two times u is an example of uh, g with the right side. Um, so the existence uh, uh, holds not only for the pi Laplacian operator, but rather for a large class of the radiance operators in divergence form from W0 and P into the dual, it's dual. And when replacing the term lambda modulus u m minus two times u by a nonlinear order term g, depending on x, u, and the gradient of u. And for this term, uh, you can uh, take, uh, which uh, uh, is allowed to have a natural growth uh, uh, in the gradient. So modulus the gradient to the power p and has a good sign condition in the sense that gx u naplayer times u is greater than or equal to zero. It's essential. This sign condition is really essential in the proof. Now, uh, when h, the right hand side in the problem one, is sufficiently smooth, uh, the existence of boundary solutions uh, was established by many papers, uh, by many authors. Uh, for example, Amman Crandall, 1978, Ben Susan Fress, Moscow, Ben Susan Fress, uh, 1984, Bocard and Rapuel, and so others. And so, so many, many other people. Uh, but in um, general, even if you consider the corresponding linear equation, uh, we cannot expect the solution to be bounded. Uh, and uh, you need to be more careful with the condition you put on H. But if, for example, uh, you take H to be in the in W minus one Q and Q is larger than N over P minus one, then uh, you do obtain the solutions uh, that the solutions are bounded. This, uh, for example, uh, according to the paper by Bocardo Giacchetti in 1985. Okay, um, then uh, uh, one uh, difficulty uh, in the treatment uh, was the fact that the m is greater than one. So in the power of modulus u, m minus two times u, lambda positive is, ensures the good sign. m is greater than one because it's arbitrary. Um, and uh, more generally, when you have the g uh, function, uh, you have no restriction respect to the modulus of u. Uh, uh, you have to be more careful. You cannot deal directly with the nonlinear TG. You have to make a, have a perturbation argument. Um, and you also have that the solution is unbounded if you take H just in the, uh, the dual of W0 and P. And so there's two things that you have to mitigate to work with the unrestricted growth of G in the gradient, in the, sorry, the modulus of U. Uh, and the fact that solution uh, is expected to be unbounded uh, if you just take H in W minus one P prime. And then uh, the solutions uh, uh, will be understood uh, uh, in the sense that the identity two holds for every V in W zero and P intersected with L infinity, uh, especially there think of this term lambda modulus U M minus two times U replace that by G uh, with the, which uh, has a growth, a natural growth in the gradient. So you have to have the test function V in L infinity. And uh, even though, uh, as I mentioned, the solution is not expected to be bounded, uh, you uh, can't uh, take uh, as a test function in the, in the identity two, they proved, the authors proved uh, that you can take the solution itself as a test uh, function. A, look, a, a very important aspect because when you uh, apply uh, approximation procedures, uh, you would like the solution itself to, to be so that you can take it as a test function. So it's a very important thing. And the solution is also proved to be in the space LM. Um, so this uh, um, facts I, I mentioned so that you can make some comparison with the results that we have obtained. Uh, if you are uh, renouncing uh, on the good sign condition on G, then you have uh, results of, um, okay, you have to be more careful, have extra assumptions, we work with solutions which may not be in W0 which may not be in W0 and P. Uh, I mentioned here some papers uh, uh, the, of Grenon, Rapuretta, and Ferrone and Messano that one can look at references to see what happens if you have other types of conditions on, on G. Uh, our aim was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to look at general isotropic elliptic equations. Always we work with bounded open subsets, uh, but we have no regularity assumption on the boundary. So simply an open uh, bounded open subset of RN. Now, isotropic elliptic and parabolic problems have received uh, uh, 
increasing attention in the last uh, last decades and this is because of their applications uh, in many areas from image recovery and the mathematical modeling of non-newtonian fluids to biology uh, and there they serve as models for the propagation of uh, epidemic diseases in heterogeneous domains um, the anisotropic operators that we will take in uh, this work uh, are quite uh, very general but the uh, model that you can keep in mind uh, if you want to simplify all the uh, to simplify uh, the proofs uh, you can keep safely in mind the anisotropic pillar plusion which is uh, uh, written uh, yes the pillar plusion anisotropic pillar plusion is a divergence operator with a component uh, j given by the uh, so you have the divergence of the vector with the component uh, modulus uh, du dxj to the power pj minus 2 dju. And dju is the derivative with respect to xj in notation. And pjs are all uh, assumed to be uh, greater than 1, less than infinity. Now, if you take all the pjs uh, equal to p, then we obtain a so-called pseudo Laplacian operator of ions. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's not exactly the Pilaplacian because, uh, you know, for the Pilaplacian, you have the divergence modulus gradient u to p minus two gradient of u. And here it's a bit different. Uh, so you have the pseudo Pilaplacian operator if you take all the pjs equal p. Um, so our problem uh, features, in fact, uh, a Lorelius operator uh, that is the prototype of which is the anisotropic Pilaplacian. So it's a divergence operator minus divergence of uh, the vector of, uh, a function vector function a uh, depending on x u and the gradient. So you have uh, minus some j one to n partial derivative uh, respect to j of a j, and uh, the conditions on our uh, on, on the assumptions on the components a j uh, will uh, ensure that the uh, operator a is bounded coercive uh, uh, pseudo monotone. All right. Now, since uh, uh, throughout this work, omega is a bounded domain, uh, the assumptions that we put on the uh, PJs uh, will be that uh, are greater than one. You can order them. We know uh, loss of generality. You can say that PJ is less than or equal to PJ plus one. But the other condition, uh, we want that the harmonic mean of the PJs, which is denoted by P, uh, to be less than the dimension of the space. Omega is in Rn, so we want that the harmonic mean P is less than N, or equivalently, you can say that the sum of the reciprocals of Pj is greater than one. That's the same uh, uh, condition. Well, the condition P less than N uh, uh, will uh, uh, be corresponding, uh, uh, you will have an isotropic Sobolev exponent, uh, you will have an isotropic uh, Sobolev embedding that will be uh, the, you can see them as the counterpart of the usual anisotropic, oh, the usual Sobolev embeddings. Uh, because of the condition P less than uh, N, uh, the one thing that you have to pay attention is that the uh, anisotropic Sobolev exponent now uh, will be like the usual Sobolev exponent, but where P represents here the harmonic mean. So the anisotropic Sobolev exponent P star is uh, NP over N minus P, but P is the harmonic mean of the PJs. And P less than N ensure that this P star is well defined. Um, in the notation uh, for a number R greater than one, as usual, R prime will be the uh, conjugate exponent, uh, held the conjugate exponent of R. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, the fact that I, we have anisotropic uh, Sobolev embeddings, uh, uh, and I will, I can uh, actually go there and show you. There's, so we have, a, a, as we expect, a similar result uh, for, um, for embeddings. You have that if P is less than N, uh, dating back to Tracy's paper in 1969, you have that there exists a positive constant S such that in the inequality 12 folds. So you have that the norm of U in LP star is less than or equal to a constant S depending on N and P product of the uh, norm of d, the u, the xj uh, in LPJ raised to the power one on n. This is for all functions u, c infinity compact spot on Rn. If you apply a density argument um, uh, in the arithmetic geometric mean inequality, you immediately get that for every u in w is run p, which is, would be, you take the closure of c infinity with compact support uh, in omega with respect to the norm 
the sum of the norms of the uh, the derivative partial derivative of, of u duj dju in lpj uh, then you get that uh, norm of v in lp star less than or equal to uh, s over n norm of v in w zero on p and uh, because, uh, so as I mentioned, omega is always bounded. You apply uh, the, uh, you, we can get by Hilder's inequality that the space W0 on P, uh, anisotropic W0 on P is included in LS continuously, uh, continuous embedding for every S uh, between one and P star, including P star and one. And you have a compact embedding uh, for every S, which is strictly less than P star, and greater than or equal to one. So the fact that omega is bounded and that we have the, P less than n uh, allows us to uh, define uh, uh, the W zero on P uh, as the closure C infinity compact support to respect to uh, in the as in, in the identity four just taking the sum of the derivatives of partial derivatives uh, DJU in LPJ. So without adding, the, otherwise you will have to add the normal U in some LQ space. Uh, but there is no need here because of omega being bounded and the anisotropic subalar embeddings. Okay, so that would be the norm. Uh, then what is our problem? So our problem is of the type of five. So we have, uh, for the moment, you can replace A by the minus uh, anisotropic Laplacian if you want to simplify. Um, and uh, we have a term of phi, that uh, capital phi, uh, which depends on X and the gradient is uh, what was uh, mentioned in the introduction is the term G. We'll, adapt to the G, but with an uh, anisotropic natural growth in the gradient. Uh, theta, the next term in the left-hand side, is something that uh, will not give you any difficulty to treat. It's something that is a character function uh, and is uh, bounded. But I will mention towards the end, we want to keep that term when we uh, extend this work to other problems. It does have to have the theta term. Then in the right hand side, we have f, which uh, uh, is an, uh, a function, arbitrary function in L1. And uh, uh, then the new class of operator, which uh, we want to include there, a, a class of operator, new class of operators from W0 P into its dual. Uh, okay, I'm saying W0 P, but it's the anisotropic W0 P. And then um, uh, the assumptions, more precise assumptions. Uh, Okay, let me see here. Let me show you the assumptions on A. Uh, so the assumptions, the first assumption is the coercivity condition. You can uh, uh, see that uh, very easily if you take the components, uh, uh, if you take the case of the uh, anisotropic Pilaplacian, you, you can immediately check uh, the condition of coercivity, the first condition. Uh, the second condition is uh, monotonicity, although one has to be careful that the operator A is not uh, monotone. It's referred as monotonicity. Um, and then the, uh, because you see you have the dependence there possibly on the, on the, on U, AJ can depend on U. So then that's not uh, giving you that the operator A is monotone as an operator from W0 and P anisotropic into its dual. Anyway, moving uh, next to the growth condition, uh, so we have a, a growth condition uh, that uh, corresponds to uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have um, uh, natural growth, uh, anisotropic natural growth in the gradient. So you see that uh, that corresponds to the last term in the right hand side, the sum L1 to N modulus Xi L to PL and to the power one on PJ prime. This is for uh, the growth condition for the component AJ. Um, and the second term, uh, a small uh, remark there, uh, that we have modulus of P to P star over PJ prime, and we have taken the largest power for the modulus of T uh, that you can take P star over PJ prime, uh, uh, because when you raise modulus AJ modulus to the power PJ prime, you get there modulus T to P star, and P star is the largest uh, exponent from the viewpoint of the Sobolev uh, embeddings, anisotropic Sobolev embeddings, when omega is an arbitrary open uh, uh, set. If you impose regularity, okay, you can improve uh, the exponent, but let's not uh, talk about that. Um, so the, we have these conditions that generalize the, um, the properties that the anisotropy P Laplacian uh, has. Uh, some uh, uh, 
more care has one has to be a bit more careful with this uh, putting the highest power for the modulus 15 the growth condition when you prove the pseudo monotonicity of the operator it can be done but one has to be a bit more careful okay uh so the we, what do we mean by the, so these are the conditions on a let me see um right uh Okay, I don't think I mentioned here about the theta. Theta is kind of totally and disbounded, so it's not a problem. Uh, and then uh, in what sense we understand the solution. So F is in L1 arbitrary or solution of problem five is a function in W01 P in such a way that phi uh, is in L1, phi of X unabler is in L1 of omega. And uh, one has to be careful, the test function will take for every V in W01 P and in an infinity, we have the identity in six. So it's quite uh, clear that I will have to take V in an infinity besides in W P because phi has a natural growth in the gradient. So then you, you uh, need also, um, so you will need there to ensure that phi applied to the solution, it's in L1 and then V is in an infinity. You can't expect better than phi to be in L1 because you have natural growth in the, uh, anisotropy natural growth in the gradient. So that's the best one can hope phi applied to the solution to be in L1 and uh, then V is in an infinity. Uh, otherwise, um, you also need V to be in an infinity because you have integral on omega F times V. So F is in L1, you need V to be in an infinity. So these are the two reasons uh, you need V in L infinity. Uh, now, uh, the new class of operators uh, B, uh, B is uh, from W0 w on P into its dual. And the assumptions we have on B, uh, we have uh, uh, the following. So uh, P1 says that the operator B or minus B need not be coercive. Minus B can need not, in general, is not uh, coercive. But you did that A minus B from W zero P into its dual to be coercive. And I will mention a bit later where you need that. Then uh, the second property is um, uh, if UL converges, whenever UL converges weakly to uh, U in W zero P and VL converges weakly to V in W zero P, then you uh, we would like that V U L apply to VL to converge to V U apply to V. And uh, the Notation there is BUL being in W0 and P, so you have the duality between W0 and P and uh, its dual, the anisotropy W0 and P. Okay, so these are the uh, two assumptions beyond MP2 that we will need if we're uh, if if the data F will be nice. Uh, but if F is in general L1, uh, we do need uh, some extra condition which frankly uh, seems to be satisfied in all the examples, uh, seems to be satisfied because of P1 in the example we have considered. So uh, in the coercitive condition for the operator A, or if you just take the anisotropy P Laplace and take mu zero equal one, you would like condition the inequality A to satisfy. Um, so it's um, uh, there the truncation, TKU is the truncation of you at level K. And we need to ensure that for any K, uh, at any level k, uh, the, inequal the the convergence, the diverge, I mean, actually, is the going to infinity, that difference go, uh, in the limit in eight, uh, as the normal view goes to infinity, you want that the difference to go to infinity. Um, as I mentioned, it's usually satisfied by P1. So if P sat P1 is satisfied, does seem to be satisfied also when you take the truncation, uh, it seems to be satisfied. Um, all right, so these are the conditions. If you have the condition for the first two P1 and P2, we'll say that uh, the operator belongs to B, uh, C class, uh, B from bounding then C is like coercivity condition in the P1. Uh, and the operators, but they are always bound, they assume that they're bounded from W0 and P anisotropic into its dual. So these are the conditions. Now you might ask uh, if we have uh, examples and there are plenty. Um, a few words about the assumption P2. Uh, which is in some sense is reminiscent of the assumption 3i in the hypothesis 2i <laughs> of theorem 1 in the paper by Lure Lyons in 1965. Uh, it's not the same, but it's uh, really reminiscent of that uh, condition. And uh, uh, condition P2 is very important because um, uh, it imp implies that the operator B is strongly continuous. 
and uh, or uh, completely continuous also called by other, uh, other authors. So if you have weak convergence in the domain, uh, then you get the strong convergence for the images of the operator. So then strongly continuous continuity gives you that the operator is pseudomonotone. And so if B is strongly continuous, minus B is strongly continuous, then minus B operator is pseudomonotone. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is an important property. Now, examples of operator uh, B. Well, uh, if you compare with the uh, mentioned, the uh, result of um, Bocardo and collaborators that I mentioned earlier, it was there a function H, consider function H in the, in the W minus one, uh, in the dual W zero one P. Well, here we take H in the dual of uh, the anisotropic W zero one P. And if you take B U for H U, B U to coincide with that H, uh, then it's immediate, you can very quickly see uh, it's nothing to prove uh, uh, that uh, the operator A, take for example, the because of the property, um, the coercivity assumption of A, uh, capital A, then you have A minus B is coercive. Uh, so it's nothing to prove there. And the second condition is uh, also uh, trivially satisfied because if you take B, U to be identically H in the dual uh, of W is P and isotropic is nothing to prove in P2. So uh, this is trivial. The second case, um, you can take, uh, uh, if you fix F in the L uh, P star prime, then uh, take B of U F, this capital F plus rho constant uh, modulus U to var theta minus two times U. Now, depending on uh, the sign of rho of this constant, then if the rho is positive, then uh, you can take uh, var theta to have condition uh, P1 uh, and uh, var theta will have to be less than P. However, and greater than one, and if rho is negative, however, you can go var theta less than P star, greater than one. Uh, condition uh, P2, uh, it's uh, easy to check using the, uh, the anisotropic embeddings. Uh, so uh, as you can see, uh, the condition, let me just mention here. So the coercivity condition uh, tells you that you have a restriction as the norm of V is large. Um, then uh, the condition P2 complements tells you what happens when you have convergence for UL, weak convergence. So there will be bounded, right? Bounded sequences for UL and VL bounded. So one condition tells you what happens when condition P1 and P3, what happens when you have norm of U large and the other condition, uh, how it behaves along the Convergent, weekly convergence sequences in W around P. Uh, so they complement uh, uh, each other. Uh, condition P2 is uh, usually uh, not difficult to check. Uh, you, you rely on um, uh, anisotropic uh, embeddings uh, uh, the theorems. Uh, and the first condition, the coercitivity depends on uh, the sign in here, depends on rho. If rho is negative, it's better because then. Uh, uh, allows you to take a larger exponent. And uh, then the other examples uh, you can uh, see, you can take uh, um, a constant alpha zero plus another constant norm of U in LR to uh, some power B1, plus you can take another term, uh, H tilde applied to U modulus to the power P2 and then multiply by uh, something uh, like again, alpha uh, constant H plus another constant capital F. What is here to observe is that you have restrictions on the powers. So B1 uh, and the B2, the, those powers will depend uh, whether alpha three is different from zero or not. So if alpha three is different from zero, uh, you have a smaller range for B1 uh, compared to the case when alpha three is zero. So just, just be, this is because of the uh, because of the coercivity condition, A minus B has to be coercive. So it depends whether uh, when you compute uh, the, yeah, the, and also uh, that, but usually P1 can be quite, uh, can be restrictive if you don't have the right sign for the coefficients. Okay, but notice that B of U can also be taken uh, like that with the, in the divergence uh, form minus some J1 to N derivative uh, respect to xj of beta j plus uh, power in u and with the right power sigma j. So it's quite a large class of operators and uh, all the properties p1, p2, p3 are satisfied for all these examples. 
Um, okay, so what our result says is uh, you can allow any F in L1 and you can allow any operator B with the properties P1, P2, B, P3. And then uh, uh, our equation has uh, at least a, a solution in the sense that is in double zero on P uh, and uh, uh, in the sense of definition one. And the function phi uh, applied to a solution is in L1. So this is uh, the main result. Uh, but uh, the, the proof uh, uh, here uh, is actually quite long because you cannot do it directly like this. You have to apply several approximations uh, approximation procedures. So let uh, therefore let me illustrate a few uh, difficulties and how we overcome them. So first of all, the solution is in is obtained double zero on P and so probably double zero on P for every F in L1. And that's uh, not easy to obtain in general because uh, you need um, to counter the, the low summability of F. So the term that helps you to counter that is the phi, the one that generalizes the G mentioned at the beginning. So the term phi has an anisotropic natural growth, in, right? And, uh, uh, but has a good sign condition. So it does help, uh, works in conjunction with the uh, operator A. Um, but if you remove the phi term, then uh, you cannot expect to have solutions uh, in the anisotropic space W0 and B. Uh, so for this isotropic uh, case already, this observation was done, was uh, made by Bocardo and Galli in 1992. So what uh, is the why is possible for us to obtain is because phi has a sign condition uh, and uh, conditions uh, on, uh, on uh, phi are uh, observing condition 10. So in the relation 10, we have a sign condition phi of t times t is greater than or equal to zero. And uh, uh, the growth condition, uh, notice the, the fact that we can take uh, anisotropic natural growth in the gradient because we have the sum j1 to n modulo psi j pj. Uh, C, the C of x is a function in L1 and in front of it, the coefficient zeta of modulus of t, notice that is a con zeta is a continuous non-decreasing function, which is positive. So there is absolutely no restriction in the growth of, mod uh, of the function in modulus of t. It's a non-decreasing function, positive non-decreasing function. So uh, this is uh, the fact uh, that we can take. Let me show you an example uh, to see what you can take here, uh, a model that you can keep in mind for the phi at the top of the page. Uh, you see the sum j1 to n uh, modulus dju to pj plus one multiplied by modulus un minus two u plus another term uh, in which the powers of the derivative partial derivative of u are uh, less than pj. And uh, the fact that you have no restriction, we have no restriction in the modulus of u. Uh, this means that theta j's are greater than one and m is greater than one arbitrary. Um, now observation there, beta j's are uh, non-negative because you want to have the sign condition that phi of u times u to be greater than or equal to zero. So if you allow all the bj's to be non-negative, you can take the second term, the second sum in the phi. But really our motivation for our study, the, the first question we wanted is to allow singularities. We wanted to allow gradient uh, lower, um, uh, terms, um, lower the terms in which uh, you can uh, have a potential uh, singularities, for example, when X approaches the boundary on which you have a homogeneous initially boundary condition. And then uh, uh, that will be, for example, corresponding to theta J's um, to be uh, between zero and one. This is in a subsequent paper, this uh, study, uh, we needed first to understand uh, without the singularity. And most importantly, if pj's are negative, yeah, so what do we do? So if pj's are all negative, uh, uh, we cannot uh, apply this result I mentioned because you have uh, that the sign condition fails and this is absolutely essential in the proofs. So then uh, you, you would have to have uh, uh, continue the work here and uh, use approximation theorems based on the theorems that I will present today. So uh, this is where it's heading, the, these results that we are have done in this paper will be at the foundation of uh, treating singular uh, singular uh, terms of the corresponding to also bj's being negative all of them some of them and also when theta j's are between zero and one uh, so uh, now how do we uh, 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 
how do you deal with the case that F is just summable? Well, we have to pay the price. Uh, uh, we also need condition 11. So condition 11 tells us that we need the lower bound for the modulus of phi. Um, and, uh, but we only need it as modulus of T is large. And I will show you a bit uh, where these things uh, appear. But if you take F, uh, if F is zero or is nice, you don't need, we don't need condition 11. So condition 11 is only to deal with uh, low summability data. Okay, so uh, we have uh, two, two, two obstacles. One is the low summability uh, for F and one is the unrestricted growth of phi with respect to the modulus of U. And how do we do this? You can um, um, approximate each of this F by F epsilon and uh, phi by phi epsilon as in relation 14. And uh, phi epsilon, uh, you take it uh, null infinity and converges to F almost everywhere. And, uh, also in L1, one modulus of epsilon less than or equal to modulus of F. But the problem is that you cannot do both approximations uh, at, at the same time. Now, this is a big restriction. And the reason for which you cannot do both at the same time is that you cannot, uh, for the approximate problem, the sequence of solutions you cannot obtain, uh, we cannot obtain a, 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 a priori bounds. We cannot obtain that the sequence is bounded in uh, anisotropy W0P. So you cannot pass to, uh, you cannot have. Uh, you cannot say that it converges weakly in W1P. You can't do much without up really bounds. So this is the problem. The limitation already was known uh, uh, and has been pointed out by Bezosan and Bocardo when you deal with the isotropic case. Uh, so you have to work uh, with two approximation schemes. First, uh, take F equals zero and deal with uh, the fact that uh, phi, uh, deal with the phi um, taking f equals zero and this is the theorem the theorem three here in which uh, we obtain better properties of the solution on the weaker assumptions so now we don't need the assumption 11 we don't need the assumption 11 and we obtain moreover that the solution u multiplied by phi is in l1 and uh, similar to the result in the isotropic case uh, that i started with we can also take as a test function the solution itself even though you don't expect to be bounded. So then uh, uh, you don't expect to be bounded because of the B class, the term B in the class, yeah, because of that. So then uh, how do we prove this case F equals zero? Now, let me say that the way we prove these theorems um, inspired by a, a paper of uh, Bocardo uh, with collaborators. Uh, so we uh, look at having a similar proof for theorems for these two theorems. Uh, and I will point out the differences. So what we do, uh, I'll explain therefore for the steps for F equals zero, some steps. So we consider approximate problems in which now F is zero, so it doesn't bother us, but now we have to approximate phi. We approximate, uh, we replace phi by phi epsilon and we obtain problems of the type 15. So for problems of the, phi, uh, of the type 15, the good thing is theta was bounded and phi epsilon is bounded and the Karatodori and bounded functions uh, that's excellent. And then uh, we are using the fact that A minus B is uh, coercive and uh, the fact that the operator B is um, uh, bounded and it satisfies the is strongly continuous, uh, minus B strongly continuous and therefore pseudo monoton. And the key idea to obtain a solution for the approximate problem, so the, for the approximate problem 15 where phi is replaced by phi epsilon and F is zero. So what do we do? We uh, the idea is the following. To prove the existence of a solution is enough to uh, prove the surjectivity uh, of the operator that you obtain uh, going with the B in the left-hand side. So it's the operator uh, that applied to U and then to V gives you the left-hand side. Yeah? And the operator, in, if you denote Psi Epsilon, what you get to Psi uh, Epsilon applied to U, V, that operator, you, we can prove that is coercive, bounded, and pseudomonotone. Uh, so all the assumptions that we have on A, uh, uh, on uh, B, and uh, the fact that uh, uh, phi epsilon is bounded and theta is bounded allows us to uh, obtain the upside epsilon squares with bounded and pseudomonotone. With the hardest proof being the upside epsilon is pseudomonotone. Okay. Uh, then uh, the fact that W0 and P isotropic space is really flexive and separable by max space uh, allows us to use, um, based on the properties uh, mentioned, uh, allows us to use the result of resist, which says that the operator of epsilon will be subjective. 
is subjective under these conditions. And therefore, the subjectivity of psi epsilon gives you the existence of a solution for the problem with phi epsilon instead of phi. So this is really, in short, I skip all the technical details here because more or less you adapt uh, uh, what you have from the literature, except that here the new class is the operate, the new novelties, the operator, the class of uh, the operators B. Okay, now in step two, uh, we have obtained for each epsilon for the approximate problem 15, we have obtained a solution U epsilon in W0 on P, in which the solution is tested for every VIN W0 on P. Why? Because this is nice here, phi and uh, phi epsilon and theta are bounded. So you allow for every V in W0 on P. Okay, so uh, the next step is to obtain uh, a priori bounds. So the a priori bounds, uh, uh, you want to prove that your epsilon is bounded in uh, uniform respect to epsilon in W0 on P, uh, anisotropic W0 on P. This will allow you to pass, because of the reflexivity of the anisotropic space, W0 on P, it allows you to pass to subsequence to obtain the convergence of epsilon to U, weak convergence uh, of the epsilon to U in the space W0 on P anisotropic. And then because W0 on P is compactly embedded in L uh, R with R less strictly than uh, uh, P star, then uh, uh, you have that up to subsequence, you have uh, almost every convergence of the epsilon to you, okay? Uh, but we need more than uh, U epsilon to be bounded uh, in W0 on P. We also uh, need that uh, uh, phi epsilon, the, in the second term, the integral of phi epsilon times U epsilon is uh, bounded. So, uh, because we would like to prove that the solution phi, uh, the solution u multiplied by phi applied to the solution is in L1. So we, we want to, uh, uh, to have the, this uh, uh, boundedness of the integral of the second term in 17. Okay, so how do we prove the, so the idea is here, so you see where we use the coercivity of A minus B and the sign condition of phi, uh, we test take as a test function uh, in our problem uh, 15, uh, since we can take any function in W0 on P, W0 on P, we take uh, exactly the solution U epsilon. So we take that, uh, use the coercivity of the operator A minus B coupled with a good sign condition of uh, phi, which reflects on the good sign of phi epsilon. It will pre be preserved the sign condition also for phi epsilon. Uh, we can uh, obtain that epsilon is bounded. Uh, then uh, use the fact that B is bounded as a bounded operator uh, from the anisotropic W zero P into its uh, dual. We have that the norm of the epsilon in the W minus one P prime is less than or equal to uh, a constant. So we have uh, uh, then the in coming back uh, uh, and using, okay, P theta epsilon, uh, I don't know if I wrote here. Yeah, so your P theta epsilon is uh, defined, like if you take the second term in the left-hand side of 16. So then that gives you an operator P theta uh, and epsilon applied to U and V. So this would be the uh, notation for the P theta epsilon. Uh, so using the coercivity condition, the fact that theta is bounded, phi epsilon is bounded, you get the inequality 19. Um, and uh, uh, then you uh, can get from here, uh, just observing that the norm of U epsilon in W on P is to the power one, and you have the sum of the norms of Dj U epsilon to Pj, Pj is strictly greater than one. So you can use Young's inequality to obtain the, um, the boundedness of the, uh, of the U in, of U in the W0 on P. Uh, and then uh, uh, from uh, the other uh, condition of the integral is simply when you take V equal U epsilon as a test function, once you prove the boundedness of uh, U epsilon in W0 on P anisotropic, then immediately you get also the, uh, the boundedness of the term uh, of the integral of epsilon, U epsilon times U epsilon. Yes, it's, it's written, the last inequality. Okay, uh, so this is in short, then uh, uh, the second part is trivial, I already mentioned. And then uh, uh, the key argument here that will also be uh, used in the uh, second, in the, the main theorem when F is in L1 
is to prove the strong convergence of the truncation of u epsilon to the truncation of u in w zero anti. So fix uh, k positive and take the truncation of level k. And uh, uh, because uh, you, you need this uh, strong convergence of the, at least of the truncation of u epsilon to the truncation of u, the strong convergence is double zero on p. Why? Because uh, in the term, um, uh, remember that phi has a natural isotropic growth in the gradient. So you cannot get away without having a strong convergence, uh, at least of the truncation of the epsilon to the truncation of u in double zero on p. Uh, so, um, but I must say that to, we are able to show more. Uh, you can, or we can obtain for the case that f is zero, we can obtain that uh, u epsilon converges to u strongly in double zero on p. Uh, I have some slides if I have time to show you how we do that, uh, but I don't think I have much uh, time. So for the strong convergence of the truncation, the key, uh, the key idea is to show that the quantity in the epsilon, uh, in quantity in 21 converges in L1, converges to zero in L1. This is the key argument, which uh, um, uh, really reduces because of the quantity, the epsilon k being non-negative by the monotonicity condition on AJs, it reduces to inequality in 23. Now the inequality in 23 divides into two parts, uh, A and B in the part 24, an epsilon goes to zero, the integral of the epsilon k when modulus epsilon greater than or equal to uh, k, that limit is zero, which is easy. And the technical part is for the inequality in B on the set where modulus epsilon is less than k. And there, the idea is to take the test function to test uh, with the uh, function z epsilon, uh, well, to define z epsilon k, the truncation of the epsilon minus the truncation of u, and uh, to uh, test uh, uh, the equation, um, to test the problem with, uh, um, uh, I don't know if I wrote here. No, I didn't. So you have to test uh, uh, with uh, the exponential uh, of lambda, take lambda large and take with the test with the exponential lambda uh, uh, z epsilon uh, k, z epsilon k uh, and this multiplied by z epsilon k. So you have to take a, a certain test function and uh, do quite a bit of calculation to prove part b. So part b is quite technical the, in relation 24. All right, then the other steps, uh, the convergence uh, of the gradient, uh, almost the real convergence of the gradient of the truncation and the convergence of the truncation double zero on p, more or less once you have relation uh, uh, lemma five, it works uh, adapting the results in the literature. So it's not very difficult. Now, once you have that, you pass to the limit in the approximation scheme. Uh, and uh, uh, you need to, to, one needs to prove, for example, uh, that, uh, of course, you have to use a diagonal argument to prove that you can extract the subsequence epsilon that does not converge, that does not depend on K. That's not difficult, it's a standard. Uh, and the last step is to pass to the limit. You use Fatus Lemma uh, as a step, and the fact that phi epsilon uh, u times u is in uh, is bounded in uh, L1. So to get that phi of u, u is in L1. Okay, now for the second proof, uh, uh, we have uh, for the main theorem, now we are introducing f. So you more or less follow the same procedure, approximating f epsilon by f, but the novelty in the a priori estimates in Lemma 8. The difficulty is that these a priori bounds, you cannot get them under the same conditions as uh, the case when f equals zero. You need extra conditions. And the extra condition is in 36. So you need the lower bound uh, that modulus of phi is bounded from below by the quantity gamma, some positive gamma, the sum modulus psi j to pj when t is large, modulus of t is greater than or equal to some uh, tau. And uh, an extra condition on b. So let me just show you quickly where this can, where do you need these extra conditions? I mentioned that I need it for the a priori bounds in the relation 37 and look another change here in the second term of the integral uh, modulus of phi applied to epsilon. Don't worry about the hat, it's just a short notation instead of phi x u epsilon nabla u epsilon. So the second integral is not anymore that integral u epsilon phi hat uh, of u epsilon is bounded, you see. Uh, we already have a weaker, uh, uh, fact here. And so the idea is to take as the test function the truncation of level tau of epsilon where tau appears in the relation 36. 
we need to test with bounded functions, uh, and that's one reason we cannot take. A, uh, we have to take the, the truncation uh, of the epsilon level tau. And then uh, when we evaluate uh, the quantity here denoted by k tau epsilon, notice that we uh, have uh, in for the operator a you have we are restrict to the case when modulus epsilon less than tau and the contribution of coercivity is not enough. Uh, and then because when modulus epsilon is greater than tau, then uh, that vanishes that part because of the gradient. And then you need to compensate on the set for modulus epsilon greater than or equal to tau. And that comes uh, the, uh, the assumption. So that, that is uh, the thing. And uh, that's why we need the extra assumption uh, to allow for psi. The condition 36 allows us to compensate on the part when modulus epsilon greater than or equal to tau, where you miss, uh, you miss information uh, when you write uh, when you take the test function, uh, the truncation of the epsilon or level tau. Okay, so the sign condition of phi appears uh, many, many times. Uh, you don't worry on the part when modulus epsilon less than tau when you work with phi, that's the reason you don't see it there. And then you use the coercivity condition to obtain um, uh, the, together with the, yeah. So now if you look at k tau epsilon, the first two terms in the inequality in the right-hand side allows you to say that it's greater or equal than some positive constant, you, which you can take the new zero, the sum of the integral on the entire omega modulus dj u epsilon to pj. You are now compensating your half on the entire omega. And then condition P3 says that there is no danger coming from the term B. So that's where we need to be controlled there. So you say that your epsilon has to be bounded. And then from there onwards, uh, it, it's not difficult to complete. Uh, the other, the strong convergence of the truncations remains valid. Now, the thing is absolutely the same for lemma nine is virtually an epsilon modification. Uh, and then you pass to the limit. One observation here, you have to be more careful because we do not have that the phi u epsilon times u epsilon is bounded in L1. So we cannot use the uh, Fatus theorem. Uh, uh, use, uh, we have to work with Vitalis theorem uh, and we have less information uh, so that's the modification. You have to be a bit more careful. Eureka, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think you should finish in five minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm, almost, uh, I'm almost there. So here uh, in the passing to the limit, because we have less information from the a priori estimates, we would uh, have to modify a bit the argument. Um, and so we, again, you have to take uh, some uh, suitable test function which is the truncation at the level one of the G M minus one U epsilon. So G index K is uh, at T is T minus the truncation uh, of, of the function. So that, that's what G in is, G index K. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's, the new, that's the new point, the new information here, the new proof, um, which we adapt an approach from Bocardo, Gallo, and Mira. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that if you take f equals zero, you can get the strong convergence of u epsilon to u in w zero on p. Uh, if you want to push this argument to work when you have f in L1, it's not gonna work. And uh, so uh, our strategy was to uh, work with just enough uh, information that the strong convergence uh, of the truncations rather than u epsilon converges too strongly, but you can recover it if uh, you work with f equals zero in the problem. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not going to through the proof. You can obtain it uh, with a bit of calculation. Uh, again, you have to take some uh, test functions uh, and work carefully, but you can uh, upgrade. You can get the maximum that you can get the com strong convergence of the epsilon to you. So I think that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Florica. Are there any questions? Any questions, comments? So, in, in, so my, perhaps one quick question before we should probably finish soon, uh, but uh, this is an existence result, yes? That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you have any conditions for uniqueness? <laughs> um, so with the uniqueness, uh, 
we have not looked at the enigmas, to be honest. Uh, it's an interesting question, uh, but we have not looked at the enigmas. There are some partialisms, but uh, uh, yeah, we have not studied the, for the enigmas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So again, are there any questions? If not, then let us thank Florica for a very interesting talk. And uh, you should have received information about the coffee break. Unfortunate, okay. Unfortunately, it is with uh, password and uh, meeting number, but there is no link. So you have to go to, uh, to Zoom to open the coffee break meeting. So see you in no a few, see you in a few minutes time. See you and thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you and I will close the meeting. Thanks. See you. Thank you. See you. See you.